COVID. So I will um, uh, tell you about, mostly I will focus on uh, thermalization. mechanism to avoid it or at least slow it down. So it's breakdown. And entanglement. Right, so we will see that somehow entanglement would be a very nice way, an informative way of uh, thinking about this, these problems. Uh, and uh, in this Sort of in these three three lectures, what you know, what I will do, I will first uh, give you a bit of motivation, right? Introduce ba basic questions, then I'll talk about thermalization and the state thermalization hypothesis. So something, you know, there I'll go relatively fast because I think Anatoly already told you about it in detail in the first couple of lectures. So and from there I will uh, ask how can we. Uh, prevent system from thermalizing, right? Or, you know, what are the mechanism of parametrically slow thermalization? And that would bring us to three main sets of phenomena. First, many body localization, pre-thermalization in a particular sense that I'll define, and quantum many body scars. And uh, uh, first, you know, first probably lecture and a half, so I'll stay pretty, sort of pretty basic and uh, will go relatively slowly, so please, you know, please don't hesitate. Well, partially because I think after a few intense lectures, you need a bit of a change of pace because I'm sure you're tired, right? But please, you know, please stop me and uh, because the goal is not to cover, cover everything, but just to give you a flavor of, you know, questions being asked and why, why they're being asked. So, and... Um, Big part of it. So maybe, maybe let me also ask you in terms of writing on the board. Can you see the whole thing, all of you, or should I stick to the center? Everywhere. Okay. Okay. Good. So you guys. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So in terms of motivation for uh, this area of research, right? It uh, it is largely experimental and related to. Um, developments in synthetic quantum systems. Systems which were largely developed for the goal of quantum, quantum simulation. Quantum simulators. And there are, there are by now several different platforms. So you have atoms called atoms and optical lattices, right? You have superconducting quantum processors where your uh, sort of elementary degrees of freedom are superconducting qubits, quantum processors. Then you have Rydberg atom arrays, trapped ions, and, and so on. But those are, those are the main ones. Uh, and so, and these systems, right, the great thing about them is that they're very tunable. So, for example, if we think about systems of ultra-cold atoms and optical lattices, you can, you can uh, control their dimensionality, right? So you can make a one-dimensional system or two-dimensional systems. Lattice, so you can, for example, there have been very nice experiment in a slightly different context, uh, realizing honeycomb lattices and uh, Haldane model on a honeycomb lattice. Uh, so you can tune hopping, interactions. Uh, so for most of these lectures, I will think about 
systems which are isolated from environment, but maybe towards the end I'll also tell you some, some recent work, about some recent work on uh, engineer dissipation. So here, right, in the systems, they also, some of them allow you to control dissipation. Uh, and um, perhaps originally driving force for these developments and the, you know, one reason why people, people are developing the systems is that they're very pure in a way, right? You know how, how atoms interact with each other. So they give you a way to realize simple, conceptually simple models, right? And the idea was, okay, maybe we can learn something about strongly correlated physics from, for example, uh, realizing Hubbard model and uh, studying its low temperature physics. So, but of course, and you know, so that's been fruitful, but of course the systems are fundamentally different from, from correlated materials, in particular in that they're to a good degree isolated from, from a thermal bath, so because you have no phonons, for example, right? Of course, they have other forms of dissipation, but it is quite different from, from, uh, right, from what you encounter in, in a solid at low temperature. Uh, and on top of that, the systems are quite dilute, right? So if you compare the distance, for example, between atoms and optical lattice, it is really many more orders of magnitude larger than uh, distance between atoms in a, in a solid. And so, and that leads to time scales being very slow. Right, so you have slow time scales. So let's say milliseconds versus picoseconds in, in solids. And so, and these two properties also, uh, also supplemented by the fact that in these systems you have uh, very nice quantum optics tools to, to image them quantum optics techniques. So all of them actually make, make the systems really, really a very nice platform to study non-equilibrium dynamics, dynamics of isolated or to a good degree isolated quantum antibody systems. So, and uh, something that people have not thought maybe that much about in the context of solids, where system, you know, time scales are very short and your system falls quickly to thermal equilibrium. So, in addition, right, the type of experiments you can do in the systems are quite different compared to what we are used to in condensed matter. Right, so in solids, you study things like You can, you can measure things like conductivity, specific heat, and so on. So these uh, properties that we are used to are kind of hard to measure in synthetic systems. So you can play tricks to get some insight into transport, for example. But instead, you can do other types of experiment, and one is you know, that I'm sure you already heard about probably even before the school or during the first lectures of the school is a quantum quench. Right, so and that's the simplest but uh, uh, very important setup. Um, so where essentially you start your system out in, a, in some initial state. So if I think about an optical lattice, I can think of putting atoms, for example, on every other side, right? So we can prepare our system in this state and then let atoms interact and uh, evolve under their Hamiltonian, right? And then, okay, they would hop around, generate 
right, they would become entangled due to, due to interactions. And uh, right, so then you can characterize a resulting evolved state, psi of t. Right, so you can characterize the state psi of t uh, using, you know, using the slow time scale, you can actually, you can uh, see, see in real time what your system does. And for example, you can do it with single site resolution in cold atomic systems. And of course, if you're now thinking also about, for example, superconducting quantum processors, you can do even more. You can measure, right? You can measure your system in different bases and uh, really extract a lot of pretty complex observables. And now, you know, so that's roughly, that's the, that's the motivation. And then we will be discussing some uh, basic, you know, basic questions about starting from this type of setup, right? Uh, and just uh, another general remark, right? So this field really sort of has developed quite quickly and uh, one reason is, is that really, you know, it is going to, in a way, to, to some very fundamental questions. How, how does thermalization occur, right? What can make your system not, not, not thermalize? Uh, but also this, uh, this endeavor um, is related to the desire to um, find better means of quantum control. So quantum control and uh, developing strategies for really, really controlling many body systems. Uh, and another interesting aspect is that, as, as we will see, is that many of the non-equilibrium phenomena, actually, many, many of the uh, non-equilibrium problems, they have uh, high computational complexity. And so, and therefore, they're, they're a very natural candidate for looking for uh, useful quantum advantage, right, and using using quantum processors, quantum, quantum computers. So, we will broadly, right, broadly we will be thinking about simple models, either of fermions, right, so for example, let me start with just writing a very simple model to be concrete. So let me consider spinless fermions AI, AI plus one with nearest neighbor hopping. I will also add on-site disorder, right? So there is an on-site disorder to where these numbers are drawn from some distribution. So let's say a flat distribution with, with W. And then we have, say, nearest, ne nearest neighbor interaction. Right, so that's first first example of a Hamiltonian, and another, right, uh, in some cases very much related or even equivalent type of uh, model we will study would be spin spin models, right? So I can think about spin chains or, for example, two dimensional spin models. Ah, and here n i is the density. On site i. Uh, and so here I can, for example, consider, well, let me just try the simplest spin model, which is actually, actually equivalent in one dimension to this fermionic model, spinless fermion model, which is Heisenberg model of spin one half with random field in the z direction. Right, so in this case, this is your disorder. And, yes, sure, yeah, yeah thanks. Uh -huh. And what we're interested in, right, so let's start with this 
quantum quench experiment. So let's say I have an initial state that is a simple unentangled product state. Let's say for the spin model, this would be, for example, spins pointing randomly in the plus or minus z direction, right? And then what I am after is understanding this time evolved wave function, in particular, understanding the, you know, whether the system reaches a steady state at long times, right? How, how does it approach, right? Approach to the steady state. And uh, broadly, we would like to understand the different regimes, right? Or maybe phases of this, right, of this dynamics, right? So what are the, if you wish, universality classes or regimes of dynamics? Right, and of course, of course, out of equilibrium, we are missing some, you know, uh, simple and powerful organizing principle like like in equilibrium, we have symmetry and symmetry breaking, right? Here we don't have that, and we are somehow, we have to find, right, find examples and uh, discover mechanisms. And, yeah? Well, so let me, let me be quite, quite loose here, so just qualitatively different behavior, right? Qualitatively different approach to the steady state, right? Or nature of the steady state. That's what I, any other questions or comments so far? Yes, that's an excellent question. So let's, let's get to it a bit later. Yes, because that, that has a different symmetry. And indeed, for example, when we talk about the physics of disorder, symmetry would be quite important. Okay, so now uh, just to set the stage. So those are the questions that somehow motivate our discussion. But now to, you know, just start with a very simple observation, right? To understand, to get an insight into dynamics, uh, we need to focus on a few things. So let me start with some simple observations. Right, so to describe dynamics, I, I can start from eigenstates. So let's say I have my Hamiltonian of this form and I have a set of eigenstates alpha. Well, I don't need this actually here. So just alpha, right, where this index runs from one to the Hilbert space dimension where Hilbert space dimension is two to the power n, for example, for uh, our spin one half model, n being the number of sites. And, and then I can say, well, my, my initial state, I can expand in terms, of, in terms of the eigenstates, right, with some coefficients, which, okay, I can qualitatively, I'll try to understand. And once I've done that, then the time evolution becomes a, very simple, so I just need to multiply, multiply eigenstates by time-dependent phases generated by the Hamiltonian evolution. Ah, I see, so camera ends here. Uh, and, and then, so what, you know, one way to characterize the state is by looking at the, at the observables, so I can choose some physical observable described by, by an operator O. Uh, for example, could be spin on some side I, spin uh, Z projection of the spin on side I. And then I can express expectation value of this operator in the time evolved state, right, by just plugging, um, plugging the time evolved state. And what I will get, so let me just write the answer because I think that must have appeared in uh, lectures by, by Anatoly. 
So I f first I have the diagonal term, right? And, and O alpha alpha, that's the matrix element of my operator O between, uh, in this case, diagonal between uh, eigenstate alpha. And then I have the off diagonal term here, alpha not equal to beta, C alpha, C beta star, E to the I, E beta minus E alpha T, O alpha beta, where I've introduced the matrix element O alpha beta, which is beta O alpha. So, and that's the matrix element. So, and this means that to gain an insight into this um, question, so we need three ingredients, right? We need to have some idea of the eigenstates. Matrix elements are crucial, right? So we also need to understand these guys and how the, how your, your initial state is expanded in terms of eigenstate. So meaning this, this coefficient C alpha, right? And that's roughly, you know, so we, what we wanna do is find examples where, for example, eigenstates and matrix elements would behave, behave uh, qualitatively differently. And let me now jump to this board and just to orient you as to what we, you know, what we will discuss. So different regimes. Keeping in mind exactly this type of quantum quench setup. So first regime, of course, is by far the most common one is that your system would thermalize. Right, in this case, you find that at sufficiently long time, psi of t effectively will have reaches thermal observables. At time, right, let's say greater than some thermalization time. Uh, and in this case, so once that happened, Right, your your system has reached thermal thermal uh, equilibrium state. Right, and then you can use statistical mechanics to describe it. So, and this this is the most common possibility. Another interesting uh, aspect here is that whatever state you start from, right. What, what matters is just the global conservation loss. So your, your uh, energy of the state, uh, variance of the energy and things like that, right? And then uh, in this case, system forgets, right? Forget initial condition, if you wish. Then on the opposite end of the spectrum here, we have a regime that is found at strong disorder, which is many body localization or MBL. So what is crucial here is having strong disorder. And in this case, your what you find is that psi of t remains non-thermal up to time which is, can be extremely long, right? Up to time, well, let me call it t star, right? And, um, Up to this time, your system actually retains memory of the initial condition.
So in this case, behavior of your system in the quantum quench is qualitatively different compared to thermal case, and that's one, one thing we will study. Right, so, and in particular, there is, a, there is an interesting uh, set of local integrals of motion which underlies this behavior. Now here, here I should mention, and we will discuss this more, so here I am um, saying that this you know, system does not thermalize up to some very long time, so we know right, that, let's say, the lower bound in some cases of this time, but really, you know, likely in higher dimensions, system eventually thermalizes, and we will talk exactly about the physics that underlies it. But for, for practical reasons, you know, on, let's say, experimentally relevant time scales, right, so the system appears non-thermalizing. Yeah? Sorry? Uh, I mean, I knew. Yes. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So the question is whether, well, if your disorder is time dependent, right, whether you only have eventual ergodicity. Well, I think it's a question of time scales, first of all, right, that you would have, I think, for example, if you were to take a finite size many body localized system and then make disorder time dependent, really, really depends how exactly this happens. And there are, there are interesting phenomena, and maybe we can come back to that. So here also I should make a comment, you know, thanks for asking the question about you know, eventual ergodicity. So what, what we will not touch upon is glassiness. Because glassiness, right, that's something of course very rich and that's a way to break ergodicity in a different sense. But that's largely classical phenomenon, right? That comes from um, having frustration and from developing uh, rough, right, sort of, sort of uh, very, very uneven energy landscape such that your system gets stuck in some of this minima. So in a way you'll see that physics we'll talk about is much simpler and, uh, you know, maybe apart from this question about, uh, for example, estimating thermalization time scale in a two-dimensional system with very strong disorder, right, ph this physics is much simpler than glasses. Now, in a way, what you would see uh, in, a, you know, in this course is that many body localized systems are very non-thermalizing, right? They have very little entanglement. They have lots of uh, integrals of motion. Uh, so naturally, there are also things that lie in between, let's say, quickly thermalizing system on one hand and many body localized system on the other hand. And so in particular, there is a set of phenomena which are called pre-thermal phenomena. So the mechanism here is pre-thermalization. So this is a pretty broad, pretty broad set of phenomena, and I will tell you about one particular uh, set of phenomena where your system thermalizes, but really uh, extremely slowly. parametrically slow. And what we will see is in this case, so I'll focus on the range of phenomena where you can actually even, uh, you can be rigorous, so because they're, they're sufficiently general and simple, and you will be able to construct a few in this case, a few uh, approximate conservation laws and prove that they would be conserved for, for a long time. Construct approximate integrals of motion.
And yet another possibility, right, is having, is uh, to have what is called sometimes weak organicity breaking, prime example being quantum many body scars. And we will see that in this case, there is a special set of initial conditions and uh, eigenstates which are non-thermal, but the, you know, for other initial conditions, your system thermalizes. So this is related to special non-thermal eigenstates. Eigenstates and initial conditions. So and that's uh, that's another another scenario when you know your system does not let's say thermalize in a quick simple manner. Yeah, please. So so there will be a parameter, and we will we will prove a bound that this approximate conservation law is stable up up to the time which is exponential in this parameter. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a phase transition because it always, if you have a big enough system, it always decays, right? But, but this time scale can be extremely long and you can, you, know, you can control it by tuning this parameter. And this parameter could be, for example, in the, this type of a model, right? Could be cranking up V, for example. And then, you know, you would see that your system develops an additional conservation law Right, which leaves time, you know, exponential in V over T, for example. So that's how. Yes, yes, yes. It's not, I think, you know, uh, I will focus more on the, on the regimes, let's say, right? I think phases, phase maybe it's too stringent, right? So let us think about, uh, you know, let's be, happy to think about phenomena which are quite different on some long time scale, right? But maybe not on the infinite time scale. And especially, you know, especially because I think we'll get to that, but for example, um, for example, really learning something about many body localization in the very long time limit and in the very large uh, system limit, it seems to be in this corner where Either you have to prove something rigorously, right, or just you know you you cannot get there with uh, experiments or or numerics. Although, as I said, there are arguments, right, which suggest uh, suggest instability in two dimensions eventually. So, any other questions? Yeah. Okay. We will, we will get to that, we will get to that. So this is more to just orient you, right? Give you yeah, sort of a map where we are going. Yes, yes, in this case, you can actually, there is a recipe how to construct them, yeah. Okay, any other? Yes, yes. Well, it's a good, I mean, um, pre-thermal phenomena are, they don't require strong disorder, right? And I think we understand them in the absence of disorder much better, right? While, um, you know, with, uh, for example, this argument for destabilizing many body localization in two dimensions. So this will involve a rare thermal inclusion, which slowly, gr slowly grows and slowly thermalizes. But there are all sorts of questions which we don't know answers to. What should be the size of this inclusion? And uh, right, so that's difficult to answer. So, but, but indeed, I think you would see people using this terminology saying that, oh, this is a pre-thermal regime of MBL, for example. So 
so pre-thermalization is a broader, right, broader, uh, broad, broad concept for uh, having some, you know, for some reason, very long thermalization time scale. Okay, any other? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, so uh, I think this is more related to this type of result that I will describe. So that's an application of this result. So I will focus, you know, indeed I think uh, relation of what we'll discuss to, for example, what Norm, Norm talked about in his lectures is that I will focus on mechanisms Right, and I think he focused more on the applications of these mechanisms. Because time sort of time crystals, they rely on having many body localization and periodically driven systems, right? That's a example of a phenomenon enabled by many body localization, but under certain conditions, right, you also uh, actually you can see parametrically long uh, time crystal type behavior without disorder, right? But protected by pre-thermalization. So that's sort of an extension of these ideas. Yeah. Sorry? For, so people usually, people, um, to me it's a, here, right? It's some combination of these two. So to me, I mean, of course, Hilbert's space fragmentation, this is something special, right? But then if you think about stability of that to perturbations, right, I think you got pretty quickly to pre-thermalization. And in fact, this connection was, was a little bit made in some, in some papers. So, okay, any other questions? Yeah. Non-ergodic. Extended non-ergodic extended state. So are you, what do you have in mind? Which model? Multifractals in many body systems. You mean, ah, you mean like, for example, having something like um, random regular graph or, well, those are, um, sorry, could you repeat, it? repeat the question? So you're asking, Uh, not, not in this sense. So I think, I think there it's a little bit of an open question, but, but you know, I think one difference of what I'll talk about from this, this story is that this, this is usually zero dimensional, right? So like random regular graph. For me, locality will be important. So actually, pre-thermal idea of pre-thermalization that I'll tell you about, so that relies on locality very strongly. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe let's get to that. I think this is, yeah. It's, you know, I'm very happy you're asking questions, but you know, hold on and then we'll get to that. But maybe let me take another. Sorry, could you repeat it? Yes, yes. Yes, so this, this is, uh, uh, Floquet pre-thermalization is a uh, prime example of uh, what I will talk about. Uh, well, in some loose sense, it doesn't require disorder. It eventually, you know, if you really think about what happens at extremely long times, it is here, right? But, but, but practically, it is important because, you know, this conservation loss can be extremely long-lived, right? And they give rise to new phenomena. Okay, so, good. So let's, so that's our, our plan. And, I heard something, but yeah, if there is a question, please, please ask.
Now, there is also, right, in the title we had entanglement, and let me just spend five minutes on commenting on, on the link between entanglement and complexity, sort of at a very naive level. Right, so you can wonder that, you know, let's say I have a spin system of n, n spins, right? It has Hilbert space dimension of two to the power n. And you can wonder, okay, it's a large Hilbert space, so how come we can actually understand anything at all about many body physics, right? And the answer is that, at least a partial answer, it's not, I don't think it's the, uh, there is more to it, but it turns out that some states in this Hilbert space are simple to describe classically. Right, and often physical states are actually in this simple category. And states can be simple and easy to make sense of classically in various ways, but one is related to how, to how quantum they are, how much entanglement do they have. So the way to, so for example, let me take some state psi in this Hilbert space, right? And I can ask how non-classical is it, right? So how, how far is it from being, being a product state? And one way to quantify it is by computing entanglement and So let's say I have my system, and what I can do, I can take a subsystem A, so which is a block, right, a block of spins, can be a block of adjacent spins, or maybe, you know, can be disconnected uh, block of spins. And so let me call my total system S. Uh, and if I have a classical state, right, then uh, state, right, state of the degrees of freedom here does not depend on the state of things outside. But if it is a quantum state, right, then, you know, there are, there are quantum correlations and then depending on the, depending on the uh, state of the complement, right, my subsystem finds itself in a different state. So what I can do, I can now look at the, I can trace, trace out everything except for, for my subsystem A, right? So I have a trace over the complement of A of density matrix of my N spins. Uh, and, you know, if my system is very entangled, then row A would, would look very mixed, right? And I can quantify degree of this being, being uh, mixed by computing the von Neumann entropy, so which in this call in this case becomes the entanglement definition of entanglement entropy. Of A is just a trace minus trace rho log rho. And then I can look, the way to characterize the state is to look at different subsystems, right, and computing their entanglement in this global pure state of the system. And, you know, so for example, maximum amount of entanglement, if I have L spins, then maximum amount of entanglement would be L times log two. Right, so you have log, log two per spin entanglement. And if you have a non-entangled state, entanglement entropy would be zero for any division, right, any choice of the subsystem. And the um, remarkable fact is that states, right, states 
with so that, that the, the way your entanglement entropy scales with the subsystem size uh, actually tells you something about simplicity or uh, complexity of your state of the system. Right, so what, you know, an important quantity to look at is the scaling of entanglement, right? And if you have a situation where entanglement grows proportional to the volume of the boundary, right, boundary of your subsystem, so in one dimension, it would mean it stays constant, right, because the boundary is just two points in this case. So in this case, you're close to a product state in some sense. And, you know, for, for, for all practical purposes, you can compress such states and approximate them using classically using only a polynomial, so n to some power, number of parameters. And so in the technology for this compression, so that's uh, tensor networks, uh, so I will not probably go, go into it here, but so, but probably this appears in some following lectures. Uh, and this, such states are called, said to have area law entanglement or boundary law entanglement. Right, and, that, and that terminology comes from, comes from, uh, from high energy physics from, from black holes. On the other end of the spectrum you have and so, and of course, you know, importantly, uh, ground states of most many body systems are in this area low entangled category, right? And you could say, well, on some level, that's why we can learn thing about ground state physics, right? It's still very rich, but, uh, um, you know, in terms of complexity of the wave functions, they're, they're on, the, on the easy side. On the, on the other end, you have states where entanglement scales as volume of the subsystem. So these are the volume law states. Sorry? A? Uh, well, so that depends on the state. So what is important is that it is polynomial and not exponential in N. So these are volume law states, and this, these are states which are very entangled, right? So essentially, you have your subsystem, but every degree of freedom is somehow strongly entangled with the outside world. Uh, so these states are very far from product states, and they cannot be, right? So we don't have a way of compressing them efficiently, uh, and a priori number of parameters goes exponentially, right, exponentially with, uh, with the number of degrees of freedom. And highly excited states, non-equilibrium states are often in this category, right, and that's, that's the origin of the complexity of the computational compl complexity of uh, phenomena we'll talk about. And in a way, you know, if you want to, right, if you have a quantum computer, right, you want to get into this regime, right, have states which are not easy to approximate classically. Now, of course, not all highly entangled states are non-trivial, right? If I have a highly, highly entangled state which has vanishing physical observables, okay, it's also, it's not very... Right, it's not uh, very easy to probe or distinguish from another such state. Right, so here, you know, uh, it's interesting to find examples which are computationally challenging, but at the same time still have uh, clear, let's say, clear signals in, in observables. So that's a bit of a challenge. So, and, okay, so with, uh, with this, uh, after this comment, so let us spend the remaining 
half an hour or perhaps we can be even faster uh, briefly talking about the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So, and uh, in 2D, sorry, could you repeat the question? Yes, yes. So, indeed, there are things. That's a good comment. So, there are there are examples where it's it's an area law, right? Area law, but you have a logarithmic cor correction. So, let me broadly put them into slightly entangled state ca state category. So, let us talk now about thermalization, and that's something that. Anatoly covered already ETH. So here my goal would be more to just, you know, give you, give you a refresher, right, and maybe make some comments which we would find useful for the later on for discussing mechanisms of non-thermalization. And here, right, there is this quite a remarkable connection that uh, also uh, you know, you also learned about in uh, Thomas lectures, right, with the, with the random matrix theory. Which is, you know, intuitively quite surprising. So random matrix models are just, you have, right, a bunch of levels which are all strongly interacting with each other. So these are zero dimensional systems, right? And then, of course, they allow you to get nice analytical results. You have, uh, right, you, you have, uh, you know that the eigenstates in this case are random vectors in this Hilbert space of your, um, of your system, right? So you're dealing with eigenstates that are Gaussian random vectors. And then ETH, of course, as you, Learn right. It, it it tells you that important aspects of this random matrix, uh, random matrix theory also show up in uh, you know in physical models of the type with local interactions of the type that I wrote you know I wrote uh, half an hour ago on the blackboard. So and the intuition right. So the intuition that uh, why why this happens, um, perhaps one one way to understand it is as follows. So we have. So let's say we have a system with local interactions. So let me divide it into the left, right, left part and right part. Right, so each one has a lot of levels. Let me label them by alpha on the left and beta on the right. Right, and, and then, you know, so these are eigenstates of each subsystem, and then I connect them with a local interaction, right, V, left, right. And intuitively, right, what should happen in this case, your eigenstates of the combined system of, of the system, so let me call them N, They should, so what should happen, I should take some energy shell here and here, right, and mix, somehow take a, uh, take a superposition of state, right, state of left and right system with, with random coefficients, and that should give me, you know, an idea of what the eigenstates look like. Right, so there is, once I connect the system, uh, this, this uh, uh, states in this, energy band hybridize, and what we can expect, right, is that eigenstate looks like that. So it's just sum over alpha tensor product beta with some, you know, restriction on energy, some delta energy, right, where these coefficients are now random, Right, but in a sense, they, 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 this 
picture tells you that your individual eigenstates of the system probe, right, they probe uh, um, all, all possible configurations, right, of left and right part. So that's the intuition. And we will post factum, right, once we look at the ETH and that for matrix elements, exactly you see that this is what, what happens. Right. So your states, this type of states are of course highly entangled and this whole picture is self-consistent as you go to larger, larger and larger scales. So now let us, unless you guys have any questions up to now, Alpha and beta are not entangled. No, they're entangled within a subsystem, right? So I'm imagining that I've constructed eigenstates at a certain scale and then I'm doubling the scale. And I'm asking how do I glue, right? How do I glue the eigenvectors that I, I got at scale L together to go to scale twice? What does it mean? Well, it tells me that my, are you asking what does this mean, this, this condition? Well, you know, if you think about the local model, then the norm of this connection is of order one, right? So you know you cannot violate energy conservation by more than one. So that's roughly, that's roughly the intuition, right? That this, uh, this, this hybridization allows you to mix things which differ a little bit in energy, but not, right, let's say, not too much. Well, here I'm being very loose, but yes, indeed, you would, you know, I think, uh, There is, of course, there is, a, there is a condition on the structure of these eigenvectors and matrix element which would give this form to, to the eigenvectors of the combined system. So, and your, you know, your, your, um, uh, ETH exactly, you know, I think you cannot prove it in general, right? But you can convince yourself that it is, it is self-consistent. That, that if ETH holds approximately at this scale, then you can go to the next scale and then it will only get better. I think that's uh, eigenstates. Where where am I using it? Or well, I think I think thermalization is str stronger than that, right? It also things that are non-local. You know, they also thermalize. Of course, you find some interesting phenomena which are a little bit related to a semi-classical limit if you take very long range interactions also, right? And that's, uh, that, that, that gives you an extra sort of uh, extra dimension in this phenomena. Okay, so let us. Now just recall ETH ansatz. And I assume, so as I said, I assume that Anatoly already covered it, so I'll go fast, but please stop me if it's, you know, something is unclear. So ETH is essentially um, supplementing a random matrix theory with, with locality, right, and putting, you know, putting this, putting this intuition that I described into, into an ansatz for matrix elements. for matrix elements. Of physical operators. So physical here is important and in a second we will discuss exactly what, you know, what physical operator means here. But so let's say I have an operator O, right? Then this Srednitsky, so this is due to Rednitsky and Deutsch, um, OMN, which is N 
matrix element between eigenstates M and N. That looks like that. There is a function. So this now becomes not an operator but a function. So I'll, you know, just draw, draw a simple O without a hat at E bar delta MN plus entropy at the respective energy F O bar omega R M N where there is a couple of properties here so O of E and E bar is the average of the two energies, En plus Am, mean, and omega is their difference. And there is a couple of extra properties, so O of E bar is smooth function of E bar and it's very close to the microcanonical value of observable O. So MC is microcanonical and it's smooth function of E bar. And same thing is function FO of E bar omega, which enters the off diagonal matrix element. It's smooth and And it's actually related to the response function of your system, right, linear response function. So that's the, right, that's the ansatz. And you know, what, roughly what it tells you is that, so here this factor, right, that's the entropy at your, at your respective energy. So if you are looking at all the eigenstates or at infinite, uh, infinite temperature, then this just becomes one over square root of the Hilbert space dimension. And this is a factor which comes, which is a scalar product of two random, ve um, random vectors in your Hilbert space of dimension D, right? That is, that, that, uh, that's the origin of this factor here. Otherwise, you know, it tells you that, um, tells you that each, each eigenstate, it has observables, diagonal observables which are essentially very close to the microcanonical values, right? So they're, all the eigenstates in thermalizing systems uh, look like uh, Gibbs ensembles, if you wish. And a priori, you know, if you think about this picture, right, this makes sense because you're effectively probing, right, you're probing all the eigenstates of your subsystem model or energy conservation, right? And therefore it's quite natural to expect that this would, this would hold and this would get better and better as you increase the system size. Now, yeah. Sorry? Cars would violate ETH. That's exactly what's interesting about them. They would, they would violate both infinite size system or for solvable models, yeah. Both, both, both diagonal and off diagonal, yeah. Mm -hmm. So in case of off diagonal? Wave function would not be. S well, so what we will see is that quantum scars, quantum many body scars are a set of measure zero. So there are quite, quite a few. And then other, you know, other eigenstates actually satisfy, satisfy ETH. So in a way, you know, yes, on the set of measure zero, this would not be a smooth function. And there was a question over there. Why is it so you're asking about the origin of this factor, right? Well, it comes from this intuition that eigenvectors are kind of like random vectors in the Hilbert space. So, and you have, so imagine I have N and M, right? They're orthogonal, but then I am acting on them with a, 
some local operator. So they're random and orthogonal, but I've acted on it with an operator, so it did something, right? But it still, it stayed lar largely random. And then this becomes just a scalar product of two random vectors, right? And typically, typically, so you can, right, you can estimate this to be one over square root of the Hilbert space dimension. Right, so just choose, choose the basis where this is the first vector, and then this guy, or vice versa, this is the first vector, then the scalar product is just the first component of this guy. But it's random, so okay, so each component is of order one over square root d. Make sense? We'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. Yeah, good question, but we'll get there. Yeah, okay, yeah. No, no, because then you have to worry about other conservation laws, yeah, exactly. Right, I think it's an interesting question within, you know, within a um, sort of, if you have more, more conservation laws, how to modify it, and in some cases you can do it, right, but. Yes, yes, by, 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 by adding more, more conservation laws, yeah. Okay, so small comment on what are the physical operators. So, turns out that this is quite, quite generic, so if you take, for example, any operator with a, with a support that is finite, right, so if you take, you know, sigma z or sigma x operator on one side, or you take a product on two sides, or on a few sides, right, this is all good. You can take some, right, some of local operators on different sides also, so that would also satisfy, satisfy ETH. And, uh, you know, what is, those, those are all operators you can measure, right, um, reasonably easily in an experiment. Now, things that do not satisfy ETH are, for example, projector onto an eigenstate, many body eigenstate, right? Those are, because exactly, so those are, in the operator form, they would look completely crazy, right? They would, they would involve a lot of products of, different spin operators, so that's something that you cannot reasonably measure in an experiment unless you have sort of exponential uh, precision and uh, time, right? So this is not, this would violate ETH naturally. Uh, and, you know, going back to concrete models, so for example, one simple model that has been, well, simple looking model because it's, it's actually quite rich, an example of a thermalizing model, for example, you can take transverse field Ising model, right, and then break integrability. So this is integrable by mapping onto free fermions, and then you can add integrability breaking Z field, and so this, this model would satisfy ETH, and uh, right, it is, uh, it is thermalizing. And this, right, so as, you know, already appeared in some lectures, right, so this is a very useful tool, so you can, you can do examinization, right, and check, check many of those uh, properties, because, uh, Thermalization in some of these models happens very, very quickly, right? Thermalization in general is a very strong, strong tendency, right? Due to the fact that your Hilbert space grows very quickly. Now, just uh, maybe, maybe one more comment on on the cage. So, uh, so I'm right, assuming that Anatoly covered, right, covered this in some detail. So there is maybe just a couple of comments. First of all, so we know that, um, you know, this, this ansatz imply, implies thermalization in a quench experiment, right? And you can, 
relatively easily derived that if you start from a from a non-equilibrium state, then at long time it would fall to uh, microcanonical value of observables, and the fluctuations, temporal fluctuations around the state would be exponentially suppressed in the system size. Right, so ETH implies thermalization. in a quantum quench, uh, then this function f o is related to, well, f squared in this case, so it's related to, to the spectral function of your system and the time-dependent correlator of t of zero, right, so that gives you access to response functions, and that's something that you, you know, that is not provided by ETH, right, that's, uh, that, that, that varies from system to system, and uh, structure, so you can use sometimes physical intuition to understand the structure of this function f o. So for example, right, as a simple example, if I have a system which is diffusive, system and I am, for example, I am choosing as my operator O, I am choosing the projection of the spin, so I assume it's conserved and my system shows diffusive transport. So then I can expect that, that this correlator Z of T, Z of zero would decay diffusively, so in one dimension one dimension it would go as one over square root of t, right? And so, and that, you know, from this we can we can uh, convince ourselves that this means that f function f squared goes as one over frequency to to power one half. And of course, in a finite system, right? So, and uh, especially especially. Doing numerics, we are, right, we are dealing with finite systems. So if the system size is L, the uh, transport in your system saturates once the, you know, once the particle reaches the, reaches the edges of the system. So, so, so the slowest diffusive mode uh, is determined by the tauless time. So here h is tauless, which is essentially the time it takes you to diffuse, right, diffuse across the system. And this means that, you know, after this time there isn't much happening, so means that F O would saturate, becomes constant approximately, at time, right, at frequencies that are below tauless frequency, Right, which is the inverse of the tauless time. And now I can sketch the behavior of this function, right, f of omega. Right, so we have one over square root omega behavior while um, in the range where we have diffusion, then we have a saturation at the tauless energy. And there is last piece, last piece what happens at very large frequencies, so at the frequencies which are greater than your, you know, local interaction scale J. So for example, you know, in my, well here, literally you can take this J, right? That's your um, largest energy in your dynamics. And so you can prove that here, actually you would encounter exponential decay with, with omega over j. And that is something exactly that would be, we would see that is directly related to Floquia, Floquia pre-thermalization. So, so this is very generic and this holds for any local observables in a system with local interactions.
Well, that's a, that's a good question. So, well, your system, maybe you would say, well, well your system settled after this Taoist time. It's greater, it's greater, yes, it's greater than Taoist time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you would expect a Gaussian or something. Well, so this is just the time it takes you. This is the slowest diffusive mode in your system, right? So, and then, okay, so if, if this is your slowest process, that, you know, that would set thermalization time. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Yes, yes. Yeah, so that's, that's an assumption, right? This is not, I'm not saying this is what happens in uh, every system, but indeed, if your system is diffusive, right, that's the, that's the slowest mode. Sorry? Sorry, could you speak up, please? Well, yes, you can be things, I mean, first of all, uh, you can have slower transport, right? Or there are examples where thermization time is uh, longer, longer than that. Yeah, okay, let me, let me come back to this question. Maybe let's, let's discuss this. Yeah. Jerome? You mean, so are you referring to the fact that there is a connection between... In terms of level, level statistics? Yes, yes, so that's a, that's a very good question. So this is a scale, right? This is a scale where your system starts to look like, like a random matrix, if you wish. Now, um, there are, I think there are cases where you can, you know, so let's say in one dimension, in a non-interacting system with, with disorder, so you can establish a relation, formal relation between diffusion and level statistics, right? So that's been done in the, I think, 80s or 90s, right? I think in many body systems, so you expect them to be related, but um, yeah, I think there isn't such a clean, let's say, clean, uh, clean connection. Okay, so I think maybe let me just make a couple more comments before we conclude for the day. So, first of all, well, first simple implication of ETH ansatz is for entanglement. So, if I take an eigenstate n, right, then what ETH tells us is that physical observables are thermal. But that tells me that if I take a sufficiently small subsystem, then every observable is thermal, so, and that means that, that the whole state, right, the whole state of the subsystem is actually thermal. So let me call it reduced density matrix of subsystem A in the eigenstate N, right, and that would be actually, it would look thermal, because, you know, if every observable is the same, then the states are, states are essentially the same. And that implies, so we know that thermodynamic entropy scales proportional to the volume at finite, right, finite en energy density. 
So that tells us that entanglement entropy in this case is actually very close to thermodynamic entropy. And that tells us that this should be a volume law, volume law scaling. Now, that's an interesting situation where, sure, the states are highly entangled, but, in, but from the point of view of observables, they're all kind of the same, right? So there is also, there is another excess of simplification you can have, so you can describe them in terms of hydrodynamics, for example, right? Because what you care about is a local, it's somehow local values of conserved quantities. And, Micro, micro canonical, yeah. You can, you can recalculate, right, you can take your, you know, you can uh, relate your energy to temperature, right, right. So this comes, I think this follows like uh, usual in uh, statistical mechanics. And maybe, so let me just conclude with coming back to this qualitative picture, right, and just uh, arguing that uh, ETH makes itself consistent. So, and that follows roughly from the fact that thermal eigenstates are very fragile to perturbation. So any perturbation leads to lots of resonances and a lot of hybridization. So let me take some Hamiltonian H, which is, satisfies the TH, right? So it has some eigenstates H, M, you know, with energy E, M. And let me now perturb it. So perturb with some, you know, for example, changing some local field, right? Some local operator. Okay, so where V would be, would be physical operator. And then let me ask how does this modify the eigenstates? Well, so what, what I can say, I can go to the basis of eigenstates and look at the matrix elements now. And ETH exactly tells me that V and M, right, so the matrix element of my perturbation between two eigenstates goes as epsilon over square root of two to the power N, right. while smallest energy difference between the energies, right, of E n and, and uh, E m, so I have two to the power n eigenstates which are spread over energy that is only proportional to the volume of the system, right? Only proportional to n. So this goes as something like n over two to the power n. So that's the level spacing, right? Right, and what you see that uh, perturbation theory here breaks down miserably Right, because perturbation theory, for, for this to be, to have only perturbative effect of eigenstates, I need that matrix element, epsilon over square root of two to the power n, be much smaller than delta of n. And this breaks down all, already for a perturbation, right, which is exponentially small. So if my epsilon star is greater than one over square root of two n, two to the power n, I have resonances. So I'm mixing, this, this, this perturbation, you know, leads to, so I have to do degenerate perturbation theory essentially. And so in my eigenstates would be reshuffled, right? I'll get a new superposition. And that's exactly, you know, now you can take this argument and think how it would play out here, right? So this setup, and you would see that exactly this would lead you to hybridizing, right, hybridizing in this uh, finite band of states, and that's what leads to this form of the wave function. And then you can, you know, leave this argument and take it to the next scale and see that, you know, this is all self-consistent. So let me stop here. I think we sort of set, right, sort of set our maybe objectives and uh, uh, refreshed, uh, I can say thermalization from the angle that we would find useful for what will follow. Uh, so, and then remaining two lectures we will cover, we will next focus on 
many body localization and then pre thermalization and quantum scars. So thanks guys. If you have any questions, let's answer them. Ah, oh, sorry? Reference. Ah, you mean uh, reviews of modern physics? Review. So I think that would, uh, that would introduce, in particular, many body localization, right? There have been, you know, interesting developments since then, right? So which, again, I'm happy to give you things which happened after, after it. But indeed, I think that's a good reference for many body localization. For thermalization, there is, a, in particular, you know, more, more detailed review by, by, by Anatoly and Luca D'Alessio and collaborators in uh, Advances of Physics. Uh, these things, uh, there are, they're not in those reviews, so, but I will, I will give you some references once we, once we get there. Right. or is it more general? Sorry, could you say it again? Uh, uh, when we talk about thermalization or realization for many body systems, do you only talk about real space or is it more general? About ther thermalization? Yeah. You mean? Um, that's a good question. So in, in the sense of observables or? Yeah, that's like, uh, like, yeah, maybe yes. Well, in, indeed, you can measure, for example, occupation numbers in the momentum space but, but typically they would be expressed back in terms of local in space operators, right? So you would come back to it in a way. So I would say, yeah, it comes back to the, yeah. I mean, you need some notion of locality. So locality in real space or I can talk about locality in momentum space or some other uh, abstract space? Uh, yeah, I think so, I think so. It's more I mean, general. the the range of observables which thermalize, which do thermalize, is quite broad. Actually, it is you need to really take very very big operators to not to see thermalization in these systems. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Everybody is exhausted. It's like we are exhausted for the day. Thank you.